Hi, welcome to Pathology Riddles. Today, we will be teaching the topic called shock. We will be talking about the definition of shock, the types and the examples of each of these types. Later, we will go to the pathogenesis of septic shock. Remember that this question is one of the favorite question of examiners. So you need to know this topic very well. Be it essay questions in undergraduate exams or multiple choice questions just before post graduation or you will also see this case in ICU setting. I would like to make a request here. In case you have not subscribed to our channel, please do press the subscribe button and the bell so that you get notifications whenever we upload videos. And also do comment and ask questions because the more questions you ask, the better you will understand the topic. Soon after this video, I would want you to go and open the Robbins textbook and read this topic. It will give you a better picture and also you will be able to recall whenever you require. So let's go directly to the video. Let's start with the definition of shock. It is a state in which decreased cardiac output or decreased effective circulating blood volume impairs tissue perfusion and leads to cellular hypoxia. Sounds complicated? Let's make it easy. What is cardiac output? It is the quantity of blood pumped into the aorta each minute by the heart. What is effective circulating blood volume? It refers to extracellular fluid that is within the vascular spaces and is effectively perfusing all the tissues. In simple words, shock is a state where body tissues are getting less blood supply and oxygen due to decreased circulating blood available. Don't write this definition in exam. It is only for your understanding. Write the longer one displayed on the screen. So what are the types of shock? The types of shock are based on cause. The first one is cardiogenic shock. So how is cardiogenic shock caused? This happens because of myocardial pump failure and it is not able to pump more blood out of the heart. The cause of myocardial pump failure are myocardial infarction, ventricular arrhythmias, etc. and many diseases affecting the heart. The second type of shock is hypovolemic shock. The word hypovolemic tells you that there is less volume. The mechanism of this type is that there is low blood volume and hence there is decreased cardiac output. And what are the conditions which cause low blood volume? They are severe burns. In cases of severe burns, the fluid is lost. As a result, the blood volume is less. Even in road traffic accidents, when there is massive hemorrhage, there is lot of blood loss. As a result, the decreased effective circulating blood volume, decreased cardiac output and hence patient is in shock. The third type of shock is associated with systemic inflammation. It could be due to microbial infection when it is called septic shock or due to non-microbial causes when it is called Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome or SIRS. In this type, when microbe infects the host, they are recognized by our innate immune cells, which lead to release of inflammatory mediators and this results in arterial vasodilation as well as vascular leakage in venous blood pooling. So there is decreased blood volume in circulation and that results in cellular hypoxia and metabolic derangement, organ dysfunction. If the cause is not removed and is persistently present, it can lead to death. What are the causes that can lead to this type of shock? It could be microbial infection, trauma, pancreatitis and so on. The fourth type of shock is neurogenic shock. In neurogenic shock, there is sudden vasodilation and this leads to decreased blood pressure, hypotension and finally decreased tissue perfusion. 
This happens in spinal cord injury, anesthetic accidents and so on. The fifth type of shock is anaphylactic shock. The mechanism is similar to neurogenic shock that is there will be acute vasodilation, decreased blood pressure and decreased blood supply to the tissue that is tissue hypoperfusion. It is mainly caused by because of IgE that is immunoglobulin E mediated hypersensitivity to either drugs, bee sting or food. These are the five types of shock. I hope you have understood the first part of the video, that is the shock, the definition, the types and examples. Now we go to a little complicated part, but we have tried to make it easy in case you don't understand, be free to ask questions. The word septic means rotten and shock broadly means reduced perfusion of tissues due to decreased blood supply. We can compare septic shock to a septic tank. It occurs when there is dysregulated host response to microbial infection. Most common infective organisms are gram-positive bacteria followed by gram-negative bacteria and fungi. As soon as these organisms enter our body, the protective mechanisms of our body gets activated to protect the body from the organism. But the success of our body defense mechanism depends on immune status of the host or the patient, the presence of other comorbid conditions, the extent and virulence of infection, and the pattern and level of inflammatory mediators production. Let's discuss the various events in septic shock. There are five mechanisms which play an important role in pathophysiology of septic shock. Mechanism 1. Inflammatory and counter-inflammatory responses. When the microbes enter our body, the receptors of on our innate immune cells recognize the microbial component. But how? Group of microbes have certain common structures that are important for their virulence. Hence, these structures are not mutated. These components are called PAMP or Pathogen Associated Molecular Patterns. So, who recognizes these microbial patterns? These PAMPs are identified by pattern recognition receptors on our innate immune cells. For example, neutrophils and monocytes. These receptors have various names like toll-like receptor, nod-like receptor, G-protein coupled receptors to name a few. When microbial components bind to the receptors or innate immune cells, these cells get activated and produce inflammatory mediators like TNF, IL-1, IFN gamma, IL-12, IL-18, HMGB1 proteins. ROS that is reactive oxygen species and lipid mediators like prostaglandin and platelet activating factors are also produced. These molecules activate the vascular endothelial cells to express adhesion molecules on their surface which take leukocytes into the interstitium. These molecules also stimulate cytokine and chemokine production. These chemokines, cytokines, interleukins and other effector molecules will cause systemic effects like vasodilation, increase vascular permeability, leading to fluid in the interstitial spaces which decreases the perfusion to the tissues and hence shock. The microbial component will also activate complement cascade directly and indirectly. The activation of complement cascade leads to production of anaphylatoxins that is C3A, C5A chemotactic fragments that is C5A and opsonins that is C3B and all three lead to pro-inflammatory state or more inflammation. The microbial components don't stop there. They also activate coagulation directly through factor 12 
and indirectly through altered endothelial function. This increases tissue factor and PAI1, which is a procoagulant and decreases thromomodulin and protein C, which inhibit coagulation. So microbial components activate receptors on the innate cell leading to release of inflammatory mediators, cause activation of complement and cause activation of coagulation. This leads to hyperinflammatory state and body now tries to suppress the innate and adaptive immune cells leading to immunosuppression as continuous inflammatory state can cause damage and not protection. So septic patients will be experiencing alternate periods of hyperinflammatory state followed by immunosuppressive state. The second mechanism involved in septic shock is endothelial activation and injury. We need to know that mediators of inflammation, that is cytokines, loosen endothelial cell tight junctions, leading to increased vascular leakage, edema, and hence all the organs are not provided with the nutrients and oxygen, plus the waste is not efficiently moving out of the cells. The activated endothelial cells also increase the production of nitric acid, C3A, C5A, PAF, which causes vascular smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilation, and systemic hypotension or fall in blood pressure. The third mechanism is induction of a procoagulant state. We learned that the microbial components directly activate factor 12 or indirectly through the endothelial activation in first mechanism. This is a continuation of that. The pro-inflammatory cytokines increase tissue factor production, leading to coagulation and decrease production of anticoagulant factors. The cytokines stimulate endothelial cells and monocytes to increase tissue factor production and signal the endothelial cells to decrease the production of anticoagulant factors. They also prevent fibrinolysis or clot breakdown. Along with this, the edema in the tissues due to vascular leak will prevent the washout of the activated coagulation factors. All these mechanisms lead to systemic activation of thrombin and deposition of fibrin-rich thrombi in the small vessels throughout the body. This leads to DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation and compromised tissue perfusion. Since in DIC, platelets and coagulation factors are greatly consumed, there will also be bleeding and hemorrhage. The fourth mechanism is metabolic abnormalities. Cytokines like IL-1 and stress-induced hormones like glucocorticoids, growth hormones, glucagon and catecholamines will increase gluconeogenesis or increase glucose production. On the other hand, the pro-inflammatory cytokines suppress insulin release from the pancreas and promote insulin resistance in liver and other tissues. These factors cause hyperglycemia. The hyperglycemia decreases neutrophil function, so the bacterial killing by neutrophils is suppressed. And increased adhesion molecule expression on endothelial cells will lead to leukocyte migration into the tissues. Also, due to stress, there is extreme increase in glucocorticoid release uh, followed by adrenal insufficiency with def deficit of these glucocorticoids. This could be due to DIC causing decreased perfusion to adrenals leading to adrenal gland necrosis or suppression of the synthetic activity of adrenal. Due to less perfusion to tissues, there will finally be hypoxia, diminished oxidative phosphorylation, and increase lactate production and lactic acidosis. The fifth mechanism is organ dysfunction. As we have learned in the second mechanism, due to inflammatory mediators, there is systemic hypotension, 
interstitial edema due to leaky vessels and small vessel thrombosis due to DIC or coagulation activation. All these mechanisms will lead to decreased oxygen and nutrient to the tissues and cellular hypoxia. Also increased cytokines and secondary mediators cause decreased myocardial contractility and cardiac output and along with this mediators cause pulmonary endothelial injury leading to acute respiratory distress. That is lungs are unable to meet the oxygen demand of the body. Finally, all these factors will lead to failure of multiple organs, mainly kidneys, heart, liver and lungs and finally death. So these are the five mechanisms which cause septic shock. It may look difficult in the beginning, but if you go through it few times, you will understand the mechanism well. So we have come to the end of the video. I hope you have understood the pathogenesis of septic shock well. Now what I want you to do is go to Robin's textbook and see that flowchart of the pathogenesis of septic shock. Because in exams you will not have that, that much paper, that much space to write the pathogenesis in an essay format. The best way to present it is in a tabular way and that is written in Robin's textbook. So go there and revise it and this will get imprinted in your mind and you will be able to present well. I hope you like this video. That's all for today. We are signing out until we meet in the next video.